Rabbi Yehoshua Yakalowitz. So just bear with me for one minute. Okay, so so Rabbi Yehoshua Yakalowitz is a renowned expert in the area of Torah scrolls and combines expertise in all these fields with a wide-ranging knowledge of Jewish history, archaeology, and Jewish ritual law. He is consulted worldwide on the provenance and dating of Torah scrolls, helping congregations, museums, and scribes. So I'm just going to add Rabbi, Rabbi Ian Kelowitz uh, to the stream here. <coughs> okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and share the presentation that will be accompanying this, uh, this event. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, get myself off okay. here. Are we live? One sec. One sec. We are live. Uh, the keynote is not shown, though. I'm like, I'm Rafi. How are you? Okay. Um, I can start. <coughs> Perhaps give me the outline. Um, over the years that I've been working on the subject trellis, last. 10 years or so, I've come to realize that the subject is far simpler than it's generally made out to be. People generally assume this is an exceptionally convoluted, complicated sugya, a subject involving many, many sources and disciplines. There's a lot of information that has to be put together for this. I've come to the realization that it's actually quite simple. For the most part, the entire subject can be summed up in uh, pretty much one small point. <clears throat> Basically, um, we know that Tchelis is meant to come from a chalazin. A chalazin <coughs> is generally assumed to be a snail. Um, this can be demonstrated quite easily based on various midrashim that are usually quoted that the chalazin has a shell, um, also based on Middle Eastern languages such as Arabic, Syriac, and others, in which chilazin uh, still today means snail. So we're looking for a dye from a snail, particularly a blue dye. We know it's possible to forge chilas from kala ilam, which is widely translated as indigo. So we're looking for a blue dye made from a snail. This is pretty much a given. This is not really where the main core of the subject lies. Um, the question is mainly which chalazin are we looking for? Is there a, particularly sna a particular snail that is one that is used for trellis? Um, the argument that's usually given could be summed up pretty simply. That we're looking for a world commodity. We're not looking for something that's unique to Jews. Only Jews are using this trellis dye, in which case it would be a lot harder to find it. We're looking for something that is used by the game too. Among other sources, besides her many, many Midrashim, there is a Gemara that we learned recently. Many of us, I'm sure, have learned this recently in Dafiemi, <clears throat> which I think is the best proof that we have at this point. The Gemara talks about finding trellis in the street. Amr Ablazar writes a trellis Bashok. Somebody finds trellis in the street. Um, if he finds pieces of wool, they're puzzle because you have the chashash. Perhaps they're used for a glima, for a cloak. This demonstrates quite clearly that chilis wasn't uniquely used only for Jews. So, basically, um, we're looking for a non-Jewish dye, not something particularly unique to Jews, some widely used dye that was snail-based and blue. If we were to find one, we're meant to assume that that's probably the trellis of Chazal. It so happens to be, again, this is pretty much the focus of the argument. The trellis of the non-Jews is rather the blue snail-based dye of the non-Jews is the trellis of the Jews. And if we were to find one, it's probably one and the same. Turns out that there is such a dye widely mentioned by in Greek and Latin sources, such as Pliny the Elder, Aristotle, and others, known as a perfura. Again, basically, to sum up the argument, there is a non-Jewish dye, 
which is widely known. It's called the perfura, and that's probably the same as the blue dye used by the Jews. This is not really a contemporary chiddush. It's something that goes back quite a while. This is already noted by the Chavasiar in a sefer from Makar Chaim. We have the autograph here. In the bottom corner, sort of a marginal note, the Chavasiar makes mention, the blood of the chalazan that we dye the chalaz therewith is not blue, rather purple, and it's made from a fish known as the purper fish. Obviously referring to this dye that's mentioned in Pliny and the other sources that I mentioned. It's mentioned also in the Shilte Gibar. Here we have the uh, close-up of that mentioned from the Chavis Yar. The Shilte Gibar, not the one on the Rif, another later source, a sefer about the Basin Mikdash written in Renaissance Italy. Um, and he writes quite clearly, The perfura is a chalazan that one makes chalaz from. Pretty straightforward. Obviously, you can go in more detail and greater depth to any of these sources and to substantiate the various arguments. There are more sources that the non-Jewish chalaz is the same as a Jewish chalaz. There are more sources that a chalaz is a snail. Each and every one of these points can be dwelt on. What is pretty widely accepted is that the perfura of the non-Jews is a snail known today as a murex trunculus. Again, there are many proofs for this. Among them, the fact that till today, in contemporary Greece, it's still known as the uh, perfura. The question that arises, which is the main focus of today's share, is it's really a double-edged question. We have a lot of information, a lot of literature that we generally call, in general, with the wide term, Kisve Chazal. This obviously includes Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi, various Midrashim of various sorts. One would expect that being that the Pefura is so widely known and widely recognized, somewhere there should have slipped from Chazal that the Tchelos is a Pefura, it's identical. The Midrashim that mentioned the two next to each other, but where's the smoking gun? Where's this clear reference? And this has become something of a quest for all the proponents of the Murex Trelis. This would obviously be the most powerful proof we could possibly find if we were to find a medrash that clearly identifies it. More so if we were to find the Gemara or something like that. The second edge of this question is obviously the flip side. If we haven't found such a source, shouldn't that be seen as something of a kind of a proof? One second, if this is not mentioned anywhere in Chazal, so the omission seemingly would point to the fact that this is not one and the same. We should find it somewhere together. It so happens to be that potentially, perhaps we do have such a source in one of the Rishayne Ashkenaz, the Ravya, one of the early Rishayne Ashkenaz, who widely quotes Yerushalmi. Quotes to Yerushalmi as follows. This is in Masechus Brachas. On the Mishnah of Misha Yakir, this is Man Kriyishma, we're going into this, we'll go into, into this in greater depth later in the year. It says as far as Misha Yakir, the time Misha Yakir, Misha Yakir and Chel Salavan, and the Rebbe says between Chel and Karasi. Again, we're going to go into this in greater depth later. He quotes to Yerushalmi, V'Kersinim B'Yerushalmi, Bin Chel Sekarasi, between Chel and Karasi is being Porfirin, Ubein prefinan. Theoretically, we have a, a clear source where it says lahedia the fairish that the trelas and the perfurin are one and the same. Perfurin theoretically is a cloth dyed by perfura. Here we have a Yerushalmi translating the uh, trelas as being perfura. What could be better than that? Obviously. This is not so simple, which is why if you speak to somebody about Tchelis, it's not the first source that comes to mind, and this is not brought as you know, an open, clear source. The basic kasha, obviously, is the fact that I'm quoting this from the Rav Yon, not the Yerushalmi, because if we were to look in the Yerushalmi, it's not there. Not only is it not in the Yerushalmi in print, in the manuscripts of Yerushalmi, the famous Ksaviyat Leiden, which is the manuscript that was at the base of our printed Yerushalmi. It's not there. 
So we're not talking about a printer's error. And it's not there in another manuscript, which we're lucky to have in the Seches Brachas, the uh, Vatican manuscript of the Yerushalmi. We have this entire sugi over here. You can see on the fourth line, Kadeshi Yenikr Bein Atzvuen. Theoretically, where it would be fitting in, Bein Tchel Salav, Bein Tchel Sakarasi. And there's no mention of this. So, obviously, this detracts, detracts quite a bit from the authority of quoting it from Yerushalmi if we open up our Yerushalmi on the shelf and it's not there. Secondly, there's another problem that this is not the only time that the Yerushalmi is quoted by the Rav Yah, and it's not there in front of us. There are many, many quotations from the Rav Yah where the Rav Yah quotes the Yerushalmi, and it's not just the Rav Yah, it's a number of Rishayim and Ashkenaz who quote the Yerushalmi, and these quotations are not there. We don't have them in our Yerushalmi. This has led many scholars over the years. This has led many scholars... Just stand in front of me so I can talk to you. This has led many scholars over the years to the conclusion that when the Rishani Ashkenaz are quoting the Yerushalmi, they're not talking about the Yerushalmi as we know it. They're talking about a different work based on the Yerushalmi, perhaps similar to the um, riff being based on the the riff based on the Talmud Bavli, or some similar work. This theory was mainly um, popularized by Victor Aptovitzer, the one who, Victor Aptovitzer, the one who first published the full Rav Yah. And every single time that the Rav Yah quotes Yerushalmi, he has a footnote and he writes, Say for Yerushalmi. And his introduction, he explains at length that we're not talking about the Yerushalmi. We're talking about some work loosely based on the Yerushalmi, perhaps in the period of the Gainim. And um, therefore, obviously, not nearly as authoritative as the Yerushalmi itself. Even if it were the Yerushalmi, another question is raised, which is perhaps even stronger. That Yerushalmi that I read from the Rav Yod just says, Bein Tchils, the currency, Bein Perfirin, and Bein Perfinan. We have no way of knowing that the Yerushalmi is actually coming to translate the terms Tchils and currency. As a matter of fact, if you look later in the Yerushalmi, the Yerushalmi gives a number of other, and the Babli too for that matter, a num- number of other ways to tell if the time Mishiachar came, a number of other simonim perhaps. Mishiachar bein Kelov Lazev, Mishiachar bein Chamor uh, La'ard, telling a wolf apart from a dog, which the Yerushalmi says is at the same time as Tchelos and Karasi. Mishiachar bein Chamor La'ard, uh, between a donkey and a wild donkey. Being that we don't know what Perfinan is, perhaps Perfinan is something else, and Porfirin is not Tchelos, and it's two other things, and not related to Tchelos and Karsi. Again, the question is whether we have a Yerushalmi, and the second question is even if we do have a Yerushalmi, how do we know that it's coming to translate the terms mentioned by the Mishnah, Ben Tchelos and Karsi? The first thing that we have to realize to put this Yerushalmi in context, is um, the first thing that we have to realize is that these quotations from the Yerushalmi that we don't have in front of us are widely used by the Paiskim. Nearly every single time the Rav Yoh brings Yerushalmi that I've checked, almost always they're accepted la One interesting example, which I didn't have a chance to upload to the screen. The Tefillah of Nachim, which we say on Tisha B'av, the source of this is Yerushalmi, it's not in the Bavli. The Rambam doesn't even bring it. And the Yerushalmi says quite clearly that we say it in Ritzay. The reason why we, Ashkenazim, and Sephardim, to the best of my knowledge, nearly every Kiel and Klai Yisrael says it on Tisha B'av, as part of Vli Yerushalayim Ircha, the reason we do that is because of Yerushalmi, again, quoted by the Rav Yah. But here this is uniquely interesting because the standard Yerushalmi clearly has it as part of Ritzay. And here we have Yerushalmi quoted only by the Rav Yah, not the Rav Yah, not the Yerushalmi that we have in front of it. And the authority of the Rav Yah's Yerushalmi supersedes the authority of the standard Yerushalmi. And this is accepted almost universally. 
The standard Yerushalmi, as a matter of fact, is quoted by the Mishnaburim, Bira Locha and Ochasesh above. And he says that if one forgot to say it in Vli Yerushalayim Ircha, one should say it in Ritzei, as Yerushalmi says clearly, which would be the more likely place to put it, as we put it in Yalav Yave, every Me'ina Ma'er. But the Chavetz Chaim does, doesn't bring the possibility even that perhaps one should say it in Ritzei Lachatchila, just like it says in Yerushalmi. Another interesting example is the bracha of Hadlakis Ner Shal Shabbos. I think pretty much everyone in Klai Yisrael says the bracha, Hadlakis Ner Shal Shabbos. The Rishayim that bring it all quoted from Yerushalmi in Masechus Brachas in Parakaraya, and it's not there. It's only from the Yerushalmi that the Rishayim Ashkenaz are quoting. If you check the halacha in Shulchan Aruch and you look at the Biagro, the main purpose of the B.R. Gross to give sources and chazal for everything mentioned in the Shulchan Aruch. He writes here that it's Yushalmi Parakuroi. He doesn't even bother saying the Vilna in there. doesn't even bother saying that there's not in the Yushalmi in front of us. He just says Yushalmi Parakuroi. Obviously, the Vilna Gaon, who clearly would have known that this isn't in the Yushalmi, no one would have been able to say this better than the Vilna Gaon, who had the entire Yerushalmi at instant command, and he just says, Yerushalmi, straightforward, it's Yerushalmi, and it's in Parakaraya. While he knew from the Beis Yosef that this is just Rishayin Ashkenaz is quoting the Yerushalmi. I have another interesting source, I'm bringing it uh, just because of the Chiddush, it's never been printed, to the best of my knowledge. This is a list of brachas that you see there, from a little-known work of the Vilna Gain called Maisa Ter. It's a compendium of lists that the Vilna Gain wrote, that those that say that he wrote it while he was in jail. This manuscript that you see in front of you was written by the Vilna Gaon son, Rav Shem Zalman ben Agro, who died during the Gro's lifetime, which means that this is written in the lifetime of the Gro. You have over here a list of brachas, Bekits or Nimrits, you can see on the top, Matar, Asur, and Zekif, Fuf, and Merika, Arts, right? All the brachas that you would know. There's a lot of interesting things you could even die from this, obviously. At the end of the list, one has v'oidiyesh brachas. You can see that they are highlighted. These are brachas that we don't find anywhere in Chazal. Brachas that we find from Ge'onim, from other sources, but they're not there in Chazal. One of them there is Anaisen L'yayev Kech, which as a matter of fact, we have a Messiah quoted by the Vilna Gaon's nephew, Rav Yaakov Kana, that the Vilna Gaon wouldn't say this because it's not there in Chazal. But up there, together with the brachas of Chazal, he quotes Ner Shal Shabbos and Ner Shal Yamtif which means that the Vilna Gaon clearly saw them as being part and parcel of Chazal. The reason the Vilna Gaon would have assumed this is probably because the Rishayi Ashkenaz has quoted not as being a separate work, but as being Chazal, part of the Gemara. They don't quote it as a work based in Yerushalmi. They always quote it as Yerushalmi itself, like we saw there in the Rav Yah itself, where he says, Garcinon bi Yerushalmi, which is the term that the Rav Yah only uses when quoting the Gemara itself. So, it would stand to reason that, as far as Allah is concerned, the Pais can accept the authority of the Rishalmi, these fragments of the Rishalmi quoting Rishani Ashkenaz, not as being a spurious source based on the Rishalmi, or perhaps erroneously ascribed to the Rishalmi, but rather as part of the Rishalmi itself and their accepted Allah. Interestingly enough, over the last years, a number of manuscripts of the Yerushalmi came to light. Um, they were found and published independently for the most part in the bindings of Svarim, of actually Christian books, in libraries around Europe. And um, they were put together, published mainly by Professor Yaakov Zussman of Hebrew University. And these look like standard Yerushalmi. These are manuscripts of the Yerushalmi itself, found in Ashkenaz. We only have one other Ashkenazi manuscript, which only has parts of it. Obviously, this was of tremendous importance. Professor Yaakov Zussman pointed out something even more fascinating. We have a sum total of 12 pages, each one with two columns on either side. We're talking about a sum total of 48 columns. To our great luck, one of these columns overlaps with one of the quotations of the Rishayin Ashkenaz in the Yushalmi that was never found in the Yushalmi before us. In Masechus Beitza, the Yushayin Ashkenaz, among them the Rav Yah, the Mardachai, the Azrua, I think, 
quote the Seder of Erev Tavshilin, and this is brought La Lach Lamaisa, they quote the Seder of Erev Tavshilin as being there in the Yerushalmi. Here we have it. It talks about Erev Tavshilin, and I apologize, it's not very clear. I took this from Professor Zussman's article. And there you have it. How do you make an Erev? Neitel Pas Kebeitza. This is Paskin La Locha, that the bread has to be a Kebeitza, and the whole say there. You say, Asher Kishan, and says, Son of Amitzis Erev, Bahadin Eruva, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, this is referenced in the Taisis and Mesechis Beitza, do not beferish Beshem the Yushalmi. What was it? One second, there's a technical problem. I see that the slides haven't switched. One moment, as uh, the slides are uploaded, sorry. Oh, here we have it. Does everybody see that now? There you have it. This is the Yerushalmi that I was mentioning earlier. This is obviously a manuscript of the Yerushalmi itself. Not a work based on the Yerushalmi, not a compendium of sources, of quotes in the Yerushalmi. We're looking at the Yerushalmi itself, and they're incorporated into Yerushalmi itself. We have highlighted the Seder of Erev Tashilin as quoted by the Yerushalmi Ashkenaz. Um, being that we only have 48 columns, it's Ashkacha that we actually have one that overlaps with one of those quotations in Yerushalmi that we don't have, but here we have it. A quotation from the Yerushalmi that only the Ashkenaz Yerushalmi have, and as part and parcel of the Yerushalmi itself, the greater Yerushalmi, we have these quotations that only Yerushalmi Ashkenaz have. What Professor Zussman points out, based on a careful analysis of the rest of this manuscript, is that very, very often the Nusach, the text of the Yerushalmi over here in this Yerushalmi manuscript, is preferable to the standard Gersa of the Yerushalmi that we have in print. He has a number of ways of proving this, besides for better readings, but a number of places where these quotations where these, rather, these fragments of your Shalmi, these 48 columns that were found in these bindings, where they overlap with fragments of your Shalmi found in the Karugniza, often one finds that the text over here is far superior to the Gersa of the Yerushalmi in print. Therefore, Professor Zussman proposes that one shouldn't look at the Yerushalmi of Ashkenazim as being a reworking of the Yerushalmi, but as an independent source of the Yerushalmi, an independent transmission of the Yerushalmi, and one would have to analyze, when we have a text of the Yerushalmi quoted in the Yerushalmi Ashkenaz, we would have to analyze it on a case-by-case -case basis against the standard Yerushalmi to see which reading is preferable. Are we looking at something that's a Hisafa or a rework in the Yerushalmi, or perhaps another Gersa? Concerning our quotation that the Rav Yah had here, Besides the fact that it's Greek terms, which theoretically wouldn't have been used at a late Kufa and Ashkenaz, particularly. Um, in order to see how well it fits in with the Yushalmi, whether it looks like an integral part of the Yushalmi, we would have to analyze taking the other question that I raised in consideration. How does this piece fit into Yushalmi? What are we looking at? Is this a translation or some alternate? way of telling what this man Kriyashma is, in which case it might be a parenthetical marginal note. In order to learn this carefully, we're going to have to revisit that Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi in Brachas is talking about the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, From when can one read Kriyashma in the morning, when one can tell apart Tchelas from Lavan? Theoretically, I don't know, Tchelas, a piece of wool that's partially dyed Tchelas and partially dyed Lavan, or perhaps two components of Tzitzis. Rebbe Lazar Eimer, between Tchelas and Karton, 
Usually this is assumed just to be the plural of karsi, and karsan, karsi, those who eat it on Rosh Hashanah will know, karsan is simply Lashon Kedesh for leek. Yushalmi goes on to explain this, and the Yushalmi says, where do we get this from? Keni Masnisen. This is how the Mishnah should be learned, should be read. Mintchilis the Shabal Lav and Shabal. What does Mintchilis the Karasi mean? It means between the Tchilis in the Tzitzis and the Lavan in the Tzitzis. Where do we get that? The Yushalmi continues, this is the beginning of Amit Bez here, and the standard Prince Yushalmi. Matam on their Abanon. What's the reasoning of their Abanon? They learn it from a Pasuk. We're Isam Isai, and we have an asmachta that we're learning this from Parashas Tzitzis to the rest of Kriyashma. At the time that you can discern the Tchelis particularly, we're Isam Isai, when you can see it particularly, that means you can see Tchelis. Now, one can see Tchelis even middle of the night without any lighting at all. Obviously, it means we're Isam Isai, one can tell it apart, and the Yishami goes on to explain, Minasamachlai, from the next available thing, the other ingredients in Tzitzis, Obviously, the white of the tzitzis. What follows is umay time and derabanon derabliyazer. What's the reasoning of derabliyazer? Right, the rabbanon have a good asmachta. We isem oisay to see particularly tchelas, but not tchelas in distinction from the other components of tzitzis. Rather, tchelas as a unique dye, and you can discern tchelas bein hatzivum until you can tell tchelas apart from other dyed. Cloths, other dyed objects, when you can tell tchelis apart from some other dyed object, and that's a karsinis. Now, the problem is obvious. The Yerushalmi understand this, the Arch and the standard Mefarshim Yerushalmi do explain it, as I said, that Benatzvuim is the other dyed objects, but karsi is not a dyed object, it's a vegetable. Here, in my opinion, is where the Yerushalmi comes in. If we look at their avya in the print, it says Gersin Yushalmi, right after he brings Pentchilis Eleven or Blazerim Pentchilis Karsi. So now their avya explains this. What's Karsi? Yesh Min Seva Shakarin Karsi. There is a dye called Karsi, and it's similar to Tchilis. But Gersin Yushalmi, the Yushalmi explains this. We learn in the Yushalmi Pentchilis Karsi, being perfumed, being perfumed. As I said, this doesn't seem to help us. If we look at the manuscripts of the Ravya, however, we find a different Gersa in the earliest manuscript of the Ravya. And this Gersa is quite obviously preferable. The Gersin Bishalmi, not Pintchels the Karasi, Pintchels the Karaton, which is how we would have it in all the manuscripts of Yushalmi, even in Karagin's a fragment of Yushalmi, many quotations of Yushalmi. What follows is not being preferred or being. Prifinin, if you look carefully, it says, Ben Purfurin u Ben Prisinan. What is Prisinan? We have a Pasuk in the Torah where it talks about the man, Zacharnu S, and the list of Okai so remembered. It continues, Ve'esa Chotzir. What is Chotzir? Targum over there says, Karte, Karose, the leeks, right? So Chotzir, which you know to mean leeks, is Karasi. Which you also know to mean leaks. So far, no chiddush. If we look at the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of Tanakh, those of you who can read Greek can see over there it says, Kaita prasa, and the leaks. Prasa therefore means leaks, which means that this term, prasinos, means leak. If that weren't enough for us, we have the Aruch, the Gersa, the dictionary. From early Tkufa Sirishainim, actually the first region we can easily date. He lives, uh, was born actually in Tkufa Sagainim, I think. <clears throat> it says in the end, Kares or Kart, Mentchelos a Karton or Karta, and he explains that what is Karta, Mintseva Yerakrak, a green dye, Ubelaz Prasino, the Latin or Greek translation with that for that would be prasinos. So here we have a clear understanding in which the Yushalmi is using a word prasinos seemingly as a Greek cloth. 
here we have this in a uh, encyclopedia, an encyclopedia of Greek and Roman clothing, as under the entry, Prasinos or Prasinos, leek green or light green clothing, right? So once again, if we look back at the Yerushalmi, it seems quite obvious what we're looking at. We can easily integrate that piece from the Yerushalmi quoted by the Rav Yoh. I've seen it asked by a number of people who, br who brought this uh, Rav Yoh, an obvious question. Theoretically, everyone in Eretz Yisrael should have known what both Tchelas and Karati are. If that's what Tchelas and Karati are, why would the Yerushalmi go ahead to translate it? If we look at the Yerushalmi, though, in context, here we have the Yerushalmi as I would reconstruct it based on the quotation from the Rav Yoh. Keni Masnisen, Ben Tchel Shabbat, Lovan Shabbat. Well, we're going to explain that Rebbe Yezer is explaining that it's not between Tchelas and Karati. Not the vegetable Karasi, which is widely known. It's between Tchelas and Karaton. Between Tchelas and rarely used, as you saw in the dictionary, green dye known as karton. So the Yerushalmi has to go ahead and explain that as bein purfurin u bein persinan, between purfura, which is translating only bedarach agav, and persinan, the leek green dye. No. Um, as a leek green dye. And I think taken all in context, I think we've gotten what we've looked for way at the beginning. Um... Here we have the smoking gun, the clear reference, theoretically in the Yerushalmi itself, if not in the Yerushalmi, in a very early Eretz Yisraeli, Gaonic source at the latest, in which the Yerushalmi is clearly translating, or this other source is clearly translating, Tchelos as being prefer. If there are any questions, I guess you can ask uh, Rabbi Hecht. Any questions yet? Okay, no questions. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi Yeshua. So I'm going to go and uh, no, ask him uh, question like. and present it through uh, Zoom. Okay. So I can't hear. We can't hear. Sorry. Do you hear me? Huh? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Now I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, you're so, muted. So thank you, Rabbi Yeshua. So there actually are a couple of questions that uh, that came that came in through Zoom. So I'm going to I'm going to bring this throw them at you. One, one, it was actually two questions by a person named Josh Fogel. Um, mm -hmm. He's asking, and this was per earlier in what you were talking about, uh, how would, how about interpreting the Erevin Daf uh, 96b that, quote-unquote, Lashonis is referring to cloaks made not Lashma and owned by Jews? So I could argue that this is only a, a Jewish die. This Lashma point is that sitzes has to be made Lashay Mitzvah, while cloaks clearly do not need to be made Lashma, since there is no Mitzvah involved. Um, that's certainly likely. As a matter of fact, uh, the Gemara was written in a Jewish setting, so my expectation would be that one would assume that it's Jewish. Why not? However, in spite of that, it still demonstrates that it wasn't used uniquely for the Mitzvah. If there was another blue dye, that was uniquely used for the mitzvah, and this perfura dye, which looked identical, then the Gemara has another step that it would have to identify. There's the question of potentially finding non tchelas blue dye, which is identical to Kali'ilan, tchelas shaloy l'shma dye, which is also identical to Kali'ilan, indigo, or tchelas itself, which means that the Gemara is missing an integral step. Secondly, even putting that aside, the second we established that it wasn't something that was uniquely used for Jews and for Jewish ritual purposes, there's no reason why it shouldn't have been widely known to non-Jews at the time. In which case, we should find mention in this other blue dye in the non-Jewish sources, contemporary non-Jewish sources, considering the fact that they mentioned many other dyes, including dyes that were made here in Eretz Yisrael, which leaves the question again, the glaring question, how could it be that there are two dyes? Why don't we find this? If there was a unique Jewish dye, which is used only for ritual purposes, I could perhaps explain that a way that the Goyim 
didn't know about it, then it was something uniquely used in the base of Mikdash, perhaps, or for a select few Yidden who wore tzitzis, perhaps. The second we established that not, Jews are using it for cloaks too, there's no reason non-Jews shouldn't know about it. Okay. Is that understood? Okay, any other questions? Yes, there's one more question by, by another guy, Aaron, on um, what's on Zoom. I once experimented with dyeing tchelas. I found that if at the end of the process I boiled up the wool, the color held really strong and didn't fade when soaked in water and ironed out. But without boiling it, it did fade. In the Gemara, part of the instructions is to boil the ingredients, right? Right, right, martina. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this is me'akev. Um, That's interesting. That's fascinating. Um, when I made this the first time, I pointed out to uh, Joel Guberman that I'd like to have my sisters boiled. And um, he told me that we've been doing that for a long time already, simply because otherwise the strings don't hold well. Um, I don't know if you realized, even after you cut the strings, they usually don't unravel, even though it was dyed. The reason for that is that the strings are stretched carefully on a frame, dropped into a vat of boiling water, and that's what both keeps the color extra steadfast and the the strings well wound. So yes, Baruch Hashem, we've been doing that. Interesting. Thank you very much for your show off. Very, okay. very, very fascinating, and it's oh. uh, it's great to uh, it's great to hear from you, and uh, great to see you in person. So I'm going to okay. over to the uh, next speaker. Okay.